welcome i'm your host pooja sarkar and you're listening to the podcast from the bookshelves of hopes india where we will be reviewing books from the world of business economics finance and every other non fiction title in between we will also be talking to the authors of these books understand their journey and what do they want the readers to take home we will also be talking about what's happening in the world of publishing in india and abroad I'm very excited because this is our first episode and welcome aboard. The first book that I have picked up is from the world of private equity. In 1987, two fund managers struggled to raise a billion dollar for their first fund. Today, it is one of the largest firms in the world with an asset under management of over 365 billion dollars. I'm talking about the Blackstone Group and we are going to discuss the autobiography of Stephen A. Schwarzman. all what it takes which was the book was launched in last september but i have with me mr schwarzman here with us to talk about the entire book his journey from philadelphia as a child to going to business school and thinking of dropping out his first transaction to joining lehman brothers and then of course the struggle of raising his own fund thank you so much for talking to us uh, first i would like to understand when you first started your shop you sent out some 400 emails to your clients asking them to be a part of your fund could you talk about the entire journey or the struggle of raising the first billion dollars for your fund well i must say it was a, it was a challenge i didn't think it would be hard i was completely wrong <laughs> we we sent out actually around 500 um you know sort of offering circulars and um we went to our first uh 18 best prospects uh and we 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 had announced we wanted to raise a billion dollars uh it was 1986 so that was a huge amount of money then particularly for two people who had never invested any money uh and we only got two of those 18 uh interested uh one for 25 million one for 50 million uh but the problem was um uh, they they each wanted us uh to raise a minimum of 500 million dollars before they'd put up that total of 75 and we we had run out of our best prospects and um we then went to i guess you would call it the B list instead of the A list uh and um uh the first place w- that would see us was was uh the Prudential Life Insurance Company of America which uh at that time was uh our largest insurance company and by far uh the the um uh, reference institution uh investing in private equity and i thought the prospects that they would give us money were remote uh, but if they were willing to see us uh of course i would go cuz hardly anyone actually wanted to see us and so um we got uh, very lucky uh we had a lunch with the chief investment officer uh and uh he was eating his uh uh tuna fish sandwich for lunch uh and um uh, i was busy describing what we were trying to do uh with our new fund as well as sharing some of our revenues from our uh uh advisory business uh and uh after he finished the first half of his sandwich I kept talking and he ate the half of the second half of his sandwich and he put it down and he looked at me and he said you know that's really interesting um uh, why don't you put me down for 100 million and i i actually couldn't believe he said it uh cuz he picked up his sandwich and and started eating it again and i i i was sort of speechless and um my only thought was i hope um he doesn't choke on the rest <laughs> of his sandwich uh, and uh he became our lead investor uh as the most important investor in the world i knew as soon as he said yes that many others would follow and we ended up raising uh 850 million dollars which now that i think back on it was astonishing 
since we'd never made an investment before. Uh, and then we raised another hundred million a year later from one of those investors. So, so um, it was a total of 950 million for a first-time effort, uh, and uh, uh, we were really lucky. And one of the lessons is that you never know who's going to be nice to you. You never know who's going to say yes. You think you do, but you don't. And the people who are logical sometimes will barely give you the time of day. And some remote person where you didn't even have a relationship at a lunch just gives you a hundred million dollars. So, so it, 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 you, you, you have to learn to accept rejection with, uh, with um, enormous regularity. <laughs> and then every once in a while, something completely unanticipated would happen and it changes the course of your life. True. In fact, I remember in your book you talked about how on October 15th, when after much thought you decided to close the fund, markets fell? Yeah, well, I had a sixth sense that something bad was going to happen. And, uh, you know, I'm also exceptionally persistent as a person. <laughs> and we were, you know, we had gotten all these commitments and we were doing the legal work. And, um, uh, and um, I was, uh, we had only two employees at that time. And so I kept walking uh, into the office probably 10, 15 times a day with the person who was responsible for coordinating with all the lawyers. And I'm sure I was exceptionally annoying uh, because I was pretty anxious. Uh, and we, we did the closing on uh, Thursday. The final... Uh, documents some people returned on Friday and on Monday uh, was the biggest collapse in the stock market uh, since the depression. It was called Black Monday. Um, I think it was October 15th, um, uh, 1987. Yes. Uh, and if we hadn't gotten all that money committed, it probably would have fallen apart. Uh, I, I was so annoying uh, uh, that, that the person who was working for uh, us left soon after uh, and became a psychotherapist. <laughs> but how has the fund transformed over the years? I mean, you have so much money as your, you know, as your AUM, more than $365 billion. How has the fund charted this entire course? Did you think it would have so much capital under AUM? I didn't think about it like that. Uh, I, I didn't have a plan for, uh, you know, exactly um, the scale. But but when we started, we announced that we were going to do three things. The first was our M&A advisory business. The second was to start a private equity business. And the third uh, was to start something that we called affiliates. And what the, those things would be, uh, which we didn't know yet, uh, would, would be in the financial area. Uh, they would be in an area we weren't already in, uh, that we would go into that area uh, because it, it, it was probably cyclically depressed or, or presented an abnormal uh, 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 investment opportunity so good that I couldn't even mess it up uh, because I was an amateur manager. Uh, if we could find that type of area where we could hire somebody who was a 10 on a scale of 10, one of the world's experts, and that that new business would generate intellectual capital that we could use to make the rest of the firm stronger and smarter. And if we could do that, then we would start that business. And actually, um, we've never changed our strategic plan. I know that sounds somewhat odd, uh, but we're always still looking for those things. And and those new businesses um, ended up being much bigger than our original business. Uh, but that wasn't a surprise. That was part of a plan. The only difference is we just didn't know what they would be because you have to respond to the changes in the world. So it's turned out to be um, really a fascinating journey uh, that's, that's accelerating. And you still sit on the Monday meeting? 
Oh, sure. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I love learning. Uh, and, um, you know, some people are uh, very smart and they can sit in a room and think great thoughts. That's not me. Uh, I need to hear things. I need to learn what's happening. Um, uh, I read a lot, uh, but I, I need to to hear what's going on all over the world because what happens is every once in a while somebody says something that simply doesn't appear to make sense given all the other things that are going on. And that one thing that doesn't make sense is actually a precursor of change. Most people will not acknowledge that something is inconsistent with everything else they know. I find that fascinating. And once I hear one of those things, it's it's like... Um, some something in my brain gets turned on, and then I keep looking for something that will will um, confirm that or allow me to dismiss it. And so um, that's some type of form of pattern recognition. Almost everyone doesn't want to do that because what happens is if you hear something that doesn't make sense, then you realize you have to change, and most people don't like changing particularly if they're doing well, right? They just want to do more of what it is. I view most things as being somewhat temporary. And they're always replaced by new things, and, and particularly in finance. Uh, and so I'm only interested, for the most part, in those new things, those <laughs> changes. Uh, and, you know, so I, I, I love our meetings uh, with all of our different groups on Monday because, you know, th that's where I... I can get the first sense that something's changing. I would come to that one. For example, in your book, you talked about um, when you were seeing that there was prices of real estate were going up, and Tuhin from India just said, you know, I have joined your India team, and you mentioned him in the book, and then you talked about how similar patterns could be sp seen in Spain, and then you saw the same back home in the U.S. Could you take us through the entire financial crisis now? Yeah, well... Uh, yeah, we were looking at uh, a real estate deal in Spain, uh, and um, uh, that um, um, w w what happened, it seemed to be high-priced, and we were having a discussion. Uh, and in that discussion, uh, you know, I didn't even know we had someone in India, um, you know, looking at real estate for us. It ended up uh, being uh, uh, Tuan uh, Parrot, who's clearly one of the most gifted people uh, uh, any place in real estate. Uh, and um, he, he said something like uh, raw land prices were going up 10 times in 18 months or something like that. And I, I actually thought um, um, we, we had somebody from another firm uh, because I'd never heard his voice before. And it was on our uh, speaker uh, in the ceiling. And I, I, I said, who's this? <laughs> And he said, this is Tuin, and I work for you. Uh, <laughs> that was pretty funny. Uh, but he was talking about, I, he said, I said, why don't I know you work for me? He said, because I have never said anything uh, uh, on any of the calls because India is overvalued. So so there's nothing to look at here. And um, so, so that was really uh, interesting because the overvaluation in India was accelerating. And... Um, uh, we saw the same thing in Spain, and, and then I, I had a house uh, in Florida where I went sometimes in the winter, and I saw in the newspaper there that um, um, house prices were going up 25%, but the population uh, uh, that year was only up 1%. So I realized we had a global bubble in residential housing, and uh, what that did is once once I saw that, you know, I told everybody in the firm about it the next week, and we discussed it, and we took a variety of decisions to not only not buy the the um, uh, residential units in Spain, uh, but but we sold almost everything we could that um, um, 
affected um, was affected by uh, residential real estate, uh, and then we just started selling all kinds of other things because the excess going on in the world was like clearly visible. Uh, and we wanted to reduce our commitments. And so that kind of, you know, sort of um, uh, sales of things, plus we invested a lot less. So when we went into the financial crisis, unlike most organizations uh, in the world, we, we were unusually well positioned so, so that when things collapsed, uh, we, we were able to focus on doing new things as opposed to um, dealing with problems of our own creation. Sure. Uh, coming to the fact that you know the book has a lot of lovely quotes that you have written. First, at the end of the preface, it talks about "I never give up" as the last line, and then there is this one where you talk about how you want, how you think like a telephone switchboard. I really love that line. Could you explain to the listeners why did you say that? Yeah. I want to be a telephone switchboard. Yeah, that was. Um, um, that's a funny thing because there aren't telephone switchboards anymore. It's all, you know, uh, electronic. But in the olden days, uh, when telephones, uh, um, you know, were invented uh, at a certain point in the technological evolution, there there was somebody sitting uh, at a big board connecting uh, calls uh, from one person to another, doing it mechanically. Uh, and uh, I always wanted to. Uh, to be that kind of function and that kind of function. And I, I, I was in uh, university and I was um, uh, uh, graduating and they, they had companies uh, that uh, would come to campus and interview us. And so uh, nobody had given me any advice on how to have an interview. So I was interviewing with a company and, and they said, well, what do you want to do for your career? And I said, well, I, I want to be a telephone switchboard. Uh, and the guy looked at me like I was crazy. And I realized I, I must have said the wrong thing, but that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to have that feeling uh, of, of knowledge and information coming in, you know, sort of like up one arm around my head, think about it, and then give direction going out the other way. That's the feeling I wanted. Uh, by the way, I did not get that job, uh, <laughs> which is probably not a surprise. Uh, but but that's uh, a bit of what I do uh, as a grown-up, uh, you know, some variation of that. And at the end of the book were, um, you know, I say something, I guess, as you've just said, that, that I never give up. The answer is once I've thought about something that I think is completely logical and rational, um, and we decide to pursue it, um, I, I never stop uh, making that happen, because it's a, it's a vision of something that, that I believe will work, that I've tested in effect, and sometimes it just doesn't work instantaneously the way people think you know if you're if you're not somebody who does something and you see success you think that was mandated that was logical that was just going to happen it doesn't happen that way it happens with enormous effort uh, and and sometimes having to modify a bit what you started with uh, but the ability to sustain rejection uh, the energy, the emotional stability, uh, and and just sort of the desperation to make something happen that you have imagined, uh, that's, that's part of being successful. Which has been your favorite transaction? I can't let you go before you tell me which has been your favorite transaction. Well, I, you know, I, I've done... So many thousands of yes, transactions. Yes, exactly. something that would have been close to your heart. Well, um, from the early days. Well, one one of the the things that was um, pretty remarkable was um, was the fact that we 
did the largest real estate transaction in, in the history of the world in uh, 2007, right before the financial crisis. It was $39 billion, and uh, we were so nervous about it, uh, we sold half of it, which was like another $20 billion. So let's call it roughly $60 billion of buy and sells. We sold the $20 billion on the same day we bought the 39 because I didn't want to take any exposure. Uh, and after we got that done, because I knew we were near a market top, we, we decided to sell half of what we had left, which was another um, uh, $10 billion. So roughly, we sold, bought and sold $70 billion in a month worth of properties. The most anybody ever had done in a year was like 10. So this is seven times more than anybody in the world did. Uh, and we ended up buying something at the very top of the market where most people went bankrupt, and we ended up making about three and a half times profit. So I don't know whether that's my favorite one, but that was my favorite one in terms of avoiding disastrous <laughs> outcomes uh, and turning it into a big profit by being worried and being conservative and not allowing the world uh, to to um, accidentally catch us uh, at, at the wrong time in the cycle. And lastly, what's your view on India? Well, India is, is, has been a great market uh, for us at, at Blackstone, and uh, we've invested $15 billion so far, uh, six of which was um, uh, last year. Uh, primarily in uh, private equity and real estate. Uh, uh, India itself, is, 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 uh, is eco its economy has been slowing. Uh, inflation's up a little bit. Uh, and, and its banking sector is, is going through some kind of uh, uh, adjustment and crisis where, where it, it, it's harder to get loans uh, now. Um, you, you would think that would worry us. Um, but quite the contrary. Uh, it's going to worry a lot of people, uh, but, but we look at that as a, as a, as a, a really uh, very interesting uh, time of opportunity where other people will need uh, capital uh, or they'll need to have to sell something to protect part of their business. Uh, and because we don't have any practical limitations, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, money, we, we have $150 billion throughout the firm that's uninvested right now, that, that for us, th this could be a very uh, uh, unique uh, opportunity. Uh, you know, we, we tend to own things for five to 10 years, so, so we can wait out uh, cycles. The interesting thing is, can we buy a really quality uh, bu bu business at it? Uh, or real estate uh, at the right price because of not us, but because of what's going on uh, in the broader economy. So, so I think uh, for us, uh, India uh, w will remain, uh, uh, you know, a very good place to be uh, for Blackstone. Thank you so much for your time.